Good morning and welcome to our worship service on this day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of our Savior and 10 days after he ascended into heaven. We know it as the day that Jesus promised to send his Holy Spirit on the disciples and with the visible sign of tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit did come. And he's still working today in our hearts through the gospel and word and sacrament as he creates and strengthens faith in each one of us. We'll begin our worship service this morning with our first hymn, Hymn 581. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, Come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. first lesson for this morning is the Old Testament reading for the day of Pentecost from the book of Joel chapter 2, a prophecy of that special day 
of Pentecost. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male servants and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So far, the Old Testament reading. We'll now join in singing the psalm of the day, Psalm 51b. Our second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Here we hear of that day of Pentecost and a portion of Peter's Pentecost sermon. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the rushing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw divided tongues that were like fire resting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now there were godly Jewish men from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When this sound was heard, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were completely baffled and said to each other, "Look." Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, 
We hear them declaring in our own languages the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and perplexed. They kept saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said, they are full of new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what God says will happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and rising cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. This will happen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So far the reading. We'll now join in singing the next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for this morning, this day of Pentecost, is the gospel lesson of the day. Take from the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Jesus said, But now I am going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asks me, Where are you going? Yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. So far the text. When people leave us, they go away. We are sad because we consider it a loss. A number of our members are going to be graduating from high school very soon and Next fall, they are going to go away to college. And at that point, parents become sad because they feel, I am losing my child. I won't see them as often. Or maybe you've had a, a co-worker that, that left the job with you and, and now moved on to something else, and, and we feel that loss. We, we wish they were still around to talk to, to, to work with. Or maybe as a parent, you've recently had one of your children get married or, or one of your children has, has moved into their own apartment for the first time and, and we have that sense of, of loss, of sadness. Things have changed. Jesus says to his disciples, but now I am going away to him who sent me. And he continues by saying, yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. See, just before these words of Jesus, he, he had told his disciples that, uh, that they were going to be persecuted, that they were going to go through hardships. And now on top of that, now he tells them, and I'm going away. And as they look at facing hardships and persecution and that Jesus isn't going to be there, he had been their leader and their strength. They're looking at themselves and they're feeling sad. They're feeling a sense of loss for themselves. But we don't have to be that way. Because there are times when people go away, we do feel sad because we are looking at ourselves. In a way, we could be selfish. Because think about it, our children graduate from high school and they're going off to college and they're, they're bettering their life. They're getting a, a greater education. They're growing up. Or maybe our coworker has found a job that will pay him or her more money or, or do something that they really, really enjoy. Or our children getting married means that the family may grow with grandchildren. Or our children are growing up as they move out and take up their own responsibility. See, there are times, many times, when somebody moves away or things change such as that where it's not necessarily sad. Maybe when we look at ourselves, it is. But in the big picture, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. That's how Jesus wants his disciples and each of us to view his going away. Yes, Jesus says, I am leaving. But it is going to be something that is going to be good for you. Because Jesus is, is going to leave them and he's going to go to the cross to suffer and die and pay for their sins. A good thing. Forty days after that, he, he's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to bodily be separated from them 
But he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Which again is a good thing. So this morning on this day of Pentecost, I want you to see that an ascension loss, that is a separation from Jesus, a, a bodily separation, is really a Pentecost gain. Because the Holy Spirit is going to come. And that gain is really what we celebrate today. Jesus said in our text, he says, it is good for you that I go away. And so we don't necessarily separate, uh, celebrate a separation, but we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. We look at all that the Holy Spirit has done for us, and it is everything. And we rejoice. Because the Holy Spirit, as he's worked in our hearts, has made us the children of God. Now the text, or the words that are for, before us this morning, are from Jesus talking to his disciples on Monday, Thursday. And as he talks to them, he says these, he tells them, I'm going away, and he says these words, and not one of you asks me, where are you going? Earlier, they had asked, you remember, Peter had asked Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus did give him an answer. Thomas even asked a similar question, where are you going? And Jesus gave him an answer, but it seemed like they really didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Now, because of their sadness, they're really not interested in that anymore. They really are thinking of themselves. What are we going to do? What are we going to do without Jesus? But where is Jesus going? Earlier, Jesus had told the disciples, I am going to prepare a place for you. Later on this evening, all of this preparation would really take a full steam. Because they would be out in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and Jesus would be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. And he would stand before the courts of the Jews and the Romans. He would be scourged and mocked and ridiculed. Ultimately, by the next morning, he would be condemned to die and hanging on a cross. He went there for his disciples, for each one of us. He went there willingly to suffer and die and pay for our sin so that we could spend eternity with him in heaven. See, Jesus went for our good. Forty days after his resurrection from the dead, he would ascend into heaven. He would be bodily separated from his disciples. And we know now that he sits at God's right hand, that is, he's, he's making full and constant use of his divine powers as God, and he lives and rules eternally for us. But here in our text, Jesus also gives us another reason for his ascension, another reason for our separation. He said, it is good for you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. See, Jesus is, is going away because his work is done. But once he's gone, he is going to send the Holy Spirit to them. And think of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would, would take our news of redemption. He would take the gospel, all the wonderful things that Jesus had done, and push them out into the world, working in people's hearts. He would work within the work of the disciples. The disciples would preach and teach, and through those words, more and more people would trust in Jesus as their Savior from sin. And that work of the Holy Spirit has been going on ever since. Because the work of the Holy Spirit has been going on in you 
and through you. As you listen to the Word of God, even today, the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. And as you share the Word of God, however that may be with the people around you, the Holy Spirit is working there in people's hearts, creating and building faith. And so the seeming loss of ascension really becomes the incredible gain of Pentecost. The, the loss of the, the physical presence of Jesus really results in the, in the sending of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And, and Jesus then tells us about the wonderful things that the Holy Spirit would do and still continues to do up to this very day. Jesus says, when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Well, what, what is Jesus talking about? Well, he doesn't leave his disciples hanging and wondering. He, he right away explains how the Holy Spirit will convict in those three areas. He says, he will convict about sin because they do not believe in me. What is the unforgivable sin? What is the sin that puts a person in hell? Oh, if you listen to people talk, they come up with all different kinds of ideas. And, and most of them boil down to this. You have to be somebody like Hitler. A really bad guy who did a lot of bad things for a very long time to a lot of people. See, hell is for the worst of us, isn't it? And that sort of makes us feel better. Because I look and I say, well, I'm not the worst of people. If anybody's going to maybe stay out of hell, it'll be me. And we begin to look at our works, we begin to look at the things that we do, and, and we figure, no, I, I won't make it to hell. I'm, I'm not that bad. Is that what Jesus says? The good go to heaven and the bad go to hell. Well, listen to Jesus when he was even more specific. He, earlier in his ministry, he said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. See, we can come up with a, a, an incredible list of horrible sins, things that people have done in the history of our world, even things of Hitler and Mussolini and whatever bad guy you want to come up with. But Jesus has suffered and died and paid for the sins of the world. Every sin has been paid for with Jesus' death on the cross. But the rejection of that forgiveness makes someone stand on their own. And none of us can do that. See, the difference between heaven and hell is but one thing. Or let's say, one person. And that's Jesus. Is Jesus your savior from sin? Or is he not? And the Holy Spirit knows that. He knows no one can save themselves. And so through the gospel, he comes and he says, Jesus has lived and died and paid for all of your sins. And the way we go to heaven is we trust in him. And so through the gospel, he creates that faith. He strengthens our faith. That is Jesus, Jesus only. Jesus. He's the difference, the only difference 
between heaven and hell. But Jesus goes on. He says, he that is the Holy Spirit will convict about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. What makes you right or righteous before God? We might go through a Rolodex in our mind and we might throw out a few good things that we have done throughout our lives that we think that has made God happy with us. And we might even look at other things people do and say, well, I'm a, I'm a pretty righteous person compared to everybody else. Well, start making your list. And when that list gets to be about that long, from my hand to the floor, I'll let you know that it's still not good enough. And when your list gets long enough that it can run out the door, I'm still going to tell you it's not good enough. Because no one is good enough. All our righteous acts are as filthy rags. And the only one who is truly righteous now sits at God's right hand. See, Jesus is our righteousness. The Apostle Paul wrote, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. Your right standing with God is totally bound up with Jesus. And Jesus is God. He lived a perfect life. He now lives and rules eternally in heaven. And so the Holy Spirit again knows that and he works that faith in us that looks to Jesus and says, He is the one who puts me in right standing with God. It's not my works. It's not who I am or who I, I think I am or, or what I think I've done. But again, the Holy Spirit continues to teach us, Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Jesus goes on, he says, He that is the Holy Spirit will convict about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. See, the devil had tempted Adam and Eve at the beginning of time and he got them to fall into sin. And that threw all of us into sin. But when Jesus came into this world to live and to die and paid for sins, and with his resurrection, he absolutely crushed the head of the devil. And the unfortunate thing is, is that everybody who wants to go after the devil, that is really the opposite of God. In a way, are already absolutely crushed. For those who wish to rebel against God, sin against God, will receive the same condemnation that the devil received. And so the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, continually points us away from the devil and, and his wishes and his will and his wisdom, which surrounds us in this world. And through that book called the Bible, continually teaches, continually guards and protects, continually tells us what is true and what is not true, continually points us to Jesus, who took our condemnation, who took our crushing, who took all of our punishment with him to the cross. And so that on the, the day of judgment, judgment day, or, or the day that any of us die, we can, we can listen to what the Bible tells us. It says, on that day, lift up your eyes. Not because God is going to condemn you or punish you, 
but because your redemption draws nigh. You're going home to be with your Savior. Faith, the Holy Spirit has worked in your hearts. See, Paul can make the definite statement. He says, So then there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do I get in Christ Jesus? The Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel in word and sacrament, he has put you in Christ Jesus. In in the book of Galatians, Paul takes really this whole festival half of the church year that next Sunday we're really drawing to a close from the beginnings of Advent to Trinity Sunday to Pentecost. We follow the work of God. We follow the work of our Savior and all that he has done for us, which culminates in the understanding that the reason we believe this, the reason that we continue to follow Jesus is because of the work of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate today. Listen to the Apostle Paul. He said, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son to be born of a woman, Advent and Christmas time, so that he would be born under law in order to redeem those under the law so that we might, would be adopted as sons. Redeem Easter, Holy Week, Lent, Jesus doing everything to buy us back from sin, death, and hell. And when he says sons here, adopted as sons, it, it's not eliminating the, the ladies, the women among us. He's really talking about being an heir of God. That means each one of us has become an heir because of Jesus' redeeming work. Because listen to what he says. He says, and because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts to shout, Abba, Father. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit, convincing you that Jesus has lived and died and paid for your sins, you have a very close connection with your Father in heaven. You know that he loves you, loves you enough to send you his Son, loves you enough to send the Holy Spirit into your hearts to make you his son, his heir. So you no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir of God through Christ. An heir. Everything that is God's is yours. really coming together on such a day as this. That we believe, we trust in all that our Savior has done for us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it becomes ours. That we can dare to stand before our world and stand even before God and say, God, I am your child. God, I am your heir. Because I have a Savior and His name is Jesus. And I know all that. And I believe all that. Because of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we pray. Holy Spirit of God, we worship and glorify you as the Lord and giver of all spiritual life. By our own thinking and choosing, we would still be lost in our sins, wandering in spiritual darkness toward eternal death. Only by your gift of faith do we now confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Only by your enlightenment do we know the loving heart of our Father in heaven and his promise of eternal life in Christ. With the Father and the Son, you are one God, one Lord. O Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus to guide us into all truth, shower your gifts and graces on all graduates. Make them truly grateful to all who have helped them with their education. Enable them to use the lessons they have learned to advance their own welfare, to serve others, and to glorify your name. As they step into an uncertain future, strengthen them through your word and sacraments, that they may be comforted and reassured of your presence. Teach them to demonstrate true wisdom and understanding by fearing and loving you and by keeping your commandments. We also thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants, Charlie and Jennifer Motsky, throughout the 25 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them so that their love for each other may never, grow <coughs> may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. O Holy Spirit, continue to preserve us in this one true faith by the means you have chosen, our Savior's gospel in word and sacraments, Enable us to present ourselves with all our abilities as thank offerings to him who sacrificed himself for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We sing our final hymn.
thank you for joining us on this day of Pentecost. Uh, next week, you will notice something a little different about our worship services. They will still be online. We will put them there uh, either Saturday night or Sunday morning. Uh, but we are going to begin uh, regular church services next weekend, June 4th. Uh, we will gather together at 7 o'clock or on Sunday at 8 o'clock and 10.30. If you are a member of St. John's, you will be receiving a, a letter concerning this and there will be a video online that you can look at that will explain how we're going to carry out our worship services uh, with the guidelines that the government now has for us that we can do that. So uh, please be aware of that and watch for that information uh, when it will be coming in the mail or look online. But uh, otherwise, have a great week. Thank you.